Good afternoon and welcome to all of the Africa Center alumni who are joining us today for the webinar on countering transnational organized crime entitled Understanding Resilience to Transnational Organized Crime, the Roles of Citizens, Communities, and Civil Society. My name is Dr. Catherine Lena Kelly, and I am the Associate Professor of Justice and Rule of Law here at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. And I am pleased to be moderator of this webinar today. Thank you to everyone across the Africa Center community who is joining us from a variety of different countries and military and civilian positions within and outside of the security sector. We're always pleased uh, to have so many of you with us involved in these important discussions. As most of you know, this is the seventh webinar in the Africa Center's monthly series about professional development for countering transnational organized crime in Africa. And we will continue this webinar series through July, 2021. Thanks to those who have attended previous webinars and welcome to people who are newcomers. You can find videos of the last six webinars proceedings on the Africa Center website, and the link will be provided in the chat box on Zoom. Those of you with us today have a variety of different backgrounds, experience, and knowledge about transnational organized crime. No experience, background, or knowledge with countering transnational organized crime is required for you to participate, but there are also some alumni in the audience whom we know have extensive experience with these issues. So these webinars have been designed with such an understanding and with the aim of nurturing peer learning and sharing of experiences on this topic. For those with limited knowledge about crime, we urge you to ask questions that will help, that will help all of us improve our understanding. And for those with a wealth of experience about transnational organized crime, we encourage you to share with us your experiences and your perspectives. As many of you know already, um, uh, about the Africa Center, these webinars are informed by our mission of advancing African security by expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships, and catalyzing strategic solutions. The mission is guided by our vision to advance African security, to advance security for all Africans, championed by effective institutions accountable to their citizens. We hope that your participation in these webinars will contribute to this, this vision and mission that we all share. In terms of our uh, objectives of the series and for today's webinar, to remind ourselves the webinar series overall is looking to expand understandings of transnational organized crime on the continent and of ways to counter it. Uh, the webinar series is also intended to introduce you to some new data on transnational organized crime in Africa and the methods and approaches for monitoring it, particularly based on some key elements of the ANAC Consortium's Organized Crime Index for Africa. And today's webinar, Understanding uh, the Roles of Communities, Citizens, and Civil Society in Building Resilience to Crime, uh, is part of this. The very first webinar in the series introduced the Organized Crime Index that I just mentioned, which is a tool that the ENACT Consortium, consisting of Interpol, Institute for Security Studies Africa and the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime have published, and it analyzes criminal actors, criminal markets, vulnerabilities to crime that African states face, and it also identifies 12 resilience factors that shape state responses to transnational organized crime. Various webinars, we have looked at these different elements of the index, and today we are here to touch upon three of those 12 resilience factors identified in the index prevention, non-state actors, and victim and witness support. So our speakers will help to describe key elements of these factors, explain how they relate to transnational organized crime and resilience, and identify some challenges and some successes in making these factors work. So now to turn to our panelists who are with us today. I'm pleased and honored uh, to welcome two highly regarded experts who will help us to develop these points based on their wealth of knowledge and experience. You have their full biographies on the website, so I, um, and I think that will also be pasted into the Zoom chat. So I will just highlight a few pertinent points about each of them here. First, Dr. Martha Mutisi is a senior program officer at International Development Research Center at the Regional Office for Sub-Saharan Africa, located in Nairobi, Kenya. Her role is to support and undertake evidence-based research that helps citizens and public authorities address the sources of violent conflict, insecurity, fragility, and poor governance. 
while acknowledging the imperative for a gender transformative approach to solutions. She was previously the manager of the interventions department at Accord. Furthermore, she has worked in various capacities and with many organizations on the intersections of peace, conflict, and development. Her assignments have included working for the University for Peace's Africa program, the University of Zimbabwe's Center for Defense Studies, the Open Society Initiative of Southern Africa, and many other organizations. Dr. Jarnet Planchnik is the Senior Lecturer in International Criminology at the University of Bristol. He is also Principal Investigator at the Hidden Narratives of Transnational Organized Crime Project. He is currently working uh, on this project in West Africa, exploring the criminalization of the trade in drugs and migration in Nigeria and Niger. This project investigates the understandings of those two trades, which are sometimes classified as transnational organized crime, from the perspectives of people acting on different sides of the law. The research guided by an advisory board of academics, policymakers, and activists also assumes that the ways that criminal and state actors speak about and understand their roles in the tramadol and human smuggling markets can help to improve understanding of the everyday reality of participating in and seeking to counter criminal activities. Garnett was previously senior lecturer in social policy and crime and an associate professor of international studies at the University of Nottingham's China campus. His research on Nigeria's role in the international trade and control of illegal drugs has been the basis for several books and articles on the politics and history of drugs and crime, policing, and healthcare in Africa. So with that, I heartily welcome both of our panelists, and we will dive into um, the moderated discussion portion of the webinar. I will alternate between asking questions uh, between our two panelists, and I would like to start with Martha. So Martha, Dr. Mutisi, to start off the discussion, in your civil society work, what have you found to be some of the ways that civilian citizens and their communities experience and think about the legitimacy of transnational organized crime and state efforts to counter it? We'll give you about six minutes to dive into pieces of that question. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Uh, and uh, uh, good afternoon uh, to, uh, and good morning to esteemed uh, participants in this webinar. Uh, good afternoon to my co-panelists. Um, I would like to start with uh, one of the uh, initiatives uh, that I found uh, from the research that we have supported that uh, is uh, proving to be uh, uh, very important uh, and useful in countering transnational organized crime. Uh, and this is the community policing initiative. Even though it started uh, as uh, something to um, uh, focus on uh, local level uh, types of crime, uh, we find that uh, uh, when 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 um, uh, police work with communities and their leaders as equal partners in the reduction of crime, they actually manage to reduce not just community level crime but also crime that is transnational in nature. Uh, we also have this concept of firewood watch committees. Uh, we also have uh, um, in uh, Southern Africa and Eastern African countries, uh, the emergence of uh, crime consultative committees, which are made up of multi stakeholders, including representatives from law enforcement, government departments, business sector, CSOs, security companies, as well as financial institutions. The formation and establishment of such mechanisms is based on the recognition uh, of the plurality of co multiple causes uh, of uh, transnational organized crime. Some of the causes are economic uh, in nature, other causes relate to the weak governance systems, and others also re uh, relate to the issues of corruption. So the um, uh, establishment of such committees that um, uh, embody a wide stakeholder, um, um, an array of wide stakeholders is a recognition of the need to tackle crime, particularly transnational organized crime in a holistic and participatory manner. Uh, beyond community policing, uh, we also have uh, community-centered security initiatives. Uh, one of the things that uh, I've discovered through the research that we support as IDRC is that it is important to also recognize organic 
uh, indigenous uh, uh, approaches to countering transnational uh, organized crime. The reality is that transnational organized crime happens in the communities and the people who are impacted by this type of crime are also community members. So they have as much vested interest uh, in ensuring that their communities are safe. So community-based approaches that we have found uh, playing novel and important roles include uh, uh, initiatives such as the Nyumba Kumi uh, in East Africa, uh, which started in uh, Tanzania, but uh, because of its success uh, uh, in Tanzania, it has been replicated in countries like Kenya, in countries like Rwanda, uh, as well as uh, in Uganda. It started as a community governance initiative where uh, 10 households per cell uh, 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 governed and monitored by what is called the Balozi, the Nyumbakumi leader. But it went beyond a governance infrastructure to actually uh, become an instrument to monitor crime, uh, an instrument to ensure that communities are safe, and also to uh, identify the felt needs of various uh, community members. Um, similar to the uh, Nyumbakumi, in um, Rwanda, we also discovered uh, the importance of um, uh, structures such as the Abunzi mediators. The Abunzi mediators and also the Inyanga Mugayo, they are local level uh, uh, judges uh, who try uh, local level cases, the local crimes uh, related to land disputes, property disputes, among others. But um, their role uh, is not just at the local level, but also they connect with uh, national government infrastructure, uh, such as the Ministry of Local Government, the Ministry of Justice. So they are actually reflecting the importance of that uh, connection between the citizens and uh, the government. Uh, also related to that is the role of traditional leaders who are customarily assigned to have jurisdiction over their communities. Uh, beyond presiding uh, over culture, they also uh, uh, oversee the ever-changing social, legal, uh, political, and ecological trends in societies. Traditional leaders, particularly in Southern Africa, through the Dare in Zimbabwe, what is called Dare, uh, in Botswana they call it the Kotla, um, they protect uh, their communities. They prevent wildlife uh, crime, crimes related to flora and fauna. They also uh, prevent, uh, are, are very helpful in preventing uh, transnational organized crimes such as uh, human trafficking, particularly child tra uh, trafficking, forced and child marriages, forced uh, uh, um, uh, domestic enslavement uh, of children. They have tried such cases, of course, in collaboration with the, uh, the various uh, uh, related line level ministries. Uh, they've become significant uh, stakeholders in mobilizing the participation of uh, com their communities in community policing initiatives, uh, in participatory uh, legal empowerment uh, projects, uh, for example. So those are some of the initiatives that we have uh, I've, I've, uh, found through the research that we support and also the interventions that we, we seek to scale up uh, in my work uh, with IDRC and other organizations. Excellent. Thank you so much, Martha, for covering um, quite a bit of ground um, and a couple of very important angles on, on how this is seen and how some of these um, civil society, uh, elements of civil society are doing work and seeing this issue on the ground. Let me turn to Dr. Kranschnik, Dr. Uh, Gernot now, and ask you a similar question. In your research on hidden narratives of transnational organized crime in West Africa, what have you found to be some of the ways that civilian citizens, their communities, and civil society actors are experiencing and thinking about um, what is called transnational organized crime, as well as state efforts to counter it? And we'll give you about six, six minutes to speak to that as well. Thank you very much, Catherine. And, and thanks a lot for inviting me and, and um, um, to be on the panel with Martha and, and with all the others. Um, so it's, it's a, a pleasure to talk about our research. And I should say that um, um, what I'm going to talk about is mostly based on, on our research project on hidden narratives of transnational organized crime in West Africa, but um, also a bit on, on previous work I had done on, 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 um, on the trade in drugs in, in the region. Um, and what I 
sort of want to talk about also links to a, a policy workshop that we held um, last year, just before the pandemic um, hit us all um, in, in Nigeria. So it, it's, it's kind of a collaborative work. It's not just our or my work. So, um, but I think to answer your question about the perceptions of organized crime, um, and related policies, you know, our project tries to maybe do something a bit different in, in a way and, and you know, we, we're trying to see how, how the people that are actually involved in those activities think about what they are doing. Um, um, so that the people that are usually considered um, criminals or organized cr uh, uh, criminals, sort of how do they sort of think about what they're doing and by better understanding what they think they're doing or what's happening, basically, we hope to sort of devise better policies or try to inform policies as such. Um, um, just to give you a background, so we, we look at the, the transport of migrants in Niger, um, specifically the city of Agadez, a, a major um, migration point for, for a long time. And we look at the, the trade in Tramadol in Nigeria and specifically the city of Lagos, um, there, which is a major hub for, for all kinds of drugs, illegal and legal as well. And sort of we, we talk to the ones that are actually um, sort of involved in those activities. I think according to your the, the crime index that you used in the past, I think these people would probably be classified as organized crime networks, you know, they, they, um, the, the way they work, although they might not perceive themselves as such. Um, but if we think about how this Acti these activities are perceived in general in society, I think they would be considered very negatively, obviously, you know, human smuggling or the, the, the use and trade of tramadol are seen as very problematic in society at large. Um, and especially if they are sort of involving young people, you know, that's the major group of people that's often concerned in pop popular discourse. But when we actually talk to the people that are involved in the traffic or trade in tramadol and, and to the the, the, the people that smuggle or that transport migrants, um, they, they think about this quite differently, actually. So they, they wouldn't rarely sort of refer to their work as organized crime. Um, it would actually be quite some level of legitimacy um, in their own views of what they're doing, often considering their work as a business, um, um, the transportation business, for example, or, or pharmaceutical business. And it would provide a livelihood for, for those people that are involved in those activities. Um, be it in Agadez or in, in Lagos. And even for the, the whole community. So if you think about the, 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 the city of Agadez, you know, the, um, when, when we did our interviews there, because our work is mostly qualitative, sort of interview based, um, th there was a sense that this whole community actually lives in a way based on, on, on those incomes from, from migration. So it's a very important income, not just for the transporters, but people providing water, accommodation and things like that. Um, again, there, there would be some a lot of legitimacy to, to this kind of activity. Um, so these local economies, in a sense, they, they, they derive a lot of um, benefits from it. But even the, the users, um, so the migrants or the users of drugs had a very different view of, of the one that we expected, you know, often seeing those um, smugglers as kind of service providers and, and even the people that were peddling tramadol, they would perceive them as, or even call them doctors, for example, sort of almost like healthcare providers. Um, so quite something that we were quite startled with in our research, you know, that this kind of level of legitimacy that, that people had, um, that basically makes us think very differently how we have to understand organized crime but also how we have to deal with it. If we, I think your second part of the question asked about how um, people were viewing state responses about organized crime. Um, and here, you know, most of the state responses that we have had since 2015 in Niger and, and 2018 in Nigeria were quite law enforcement based, criminal justice crackdowns on those activities. They were very well intended, but didn't always have the sort of the, the, the impact that they wanted to have in a way. And when we talked to the people that we, we interviewed, you know, they, they saw them often as quite, um, do you say that, not very helpful for their livelihoods because they actually took away those um, incomes that they had, the whole city of Agadez to some degree um, still suffering from that 2015 law, which, which cracked down on, on the, on the on the transport of migrants across the Sahara. So 
these activities, uh, these policies can be well intended, but actually have negative consequences, which was another kind of um, surprise in a sense. Um, and even for the ones that they should protect, you know, these are the, the migrants and the drug, young drug users, for example, um, didn't actually have that positive effect because a lot of the migrants still wanted to do and, and did continue their journeys across the Sahara, but now had to rely on, on, on the black market much more actually and, and take much more risky routes through the Sahara and there's actually a higher um, rate of, 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 of people being abandoned in the Sahara because of that and, and people in the tramadol market similarly you know they had to rely on tramadol from much more sort of black market sources so in, in a sense those responses didn't always have that impact that that we that and, and were perceived very differently on the ground, basically. I think that's the, the major message. Great. Yes, thank you for um, giving us some preview of the, the findings that yeah, you came up with um, as you carried out this research um, that do highlight some interesting um, and uh, concerning different elements of the political economy of all of this, um, speaking of those dangerous, more dangerous routes or, or um, different types of markets that may need to be engaged in, depending on the different kinds of responses that we're seeing on the local level. That's very insightful. Um, I will turn next back to Dr. Martha. I want to ask uh, actually both panelists now a second question. Um, what roles can local civil society, community leaders, and citizens play in relation to African security and justice actors in developing strategic responses to prevent and to counter transnational organized crime. So for Martha, I want to ask you that question. And then also, you know, I don't know if there are best practices from your civil society work with IDRC or, or elsewhere that you might be able to share as examples when you're answering this. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Yes. Um, so I think I'll start from the uh, premise that um, a decline in trust and confidence uh, in the police, in law enforcement, uh, in the security sector uh, and in the judiciary can be harmful. So one of the strategies that civil society can use is to uh, be a bridge builder, unity uh, and uh, law enforcement, as well as uh, between the community uh, and security actors and the judiciary. That is very important for a collaborative approach uh, to countering transnational organized crime. When citizens feel that they have um, uh, mechanisms for reporting and for being heard, and also when they feel report uh, the crimes, something is done about uh, uh, those particular crimes. They can see the uh, uh, prosecution taking place. They can see uh, redress mechanisms being put in place. That encourages them to play their part uh, and also to play it very effectively. And then uh, I think related to that, civil society can also facilitate um, uh, improvements in uh, countering transnational organized crime through um, encouraging a collaborative approach to crime prevention, uh, facilitating targeted partnerships with government departments uh, and civil society organizations, business actors, as well as those who are affected uh, by the crime. Uh, the other issue is also to engage uh, in capacity building uh, of the uh, uh, actors who are involved uh, in responding to transnational organized crime or to respond to crime at the national level, particularly capacity building of the police, capacity building of the security actors, uh, capacity building of the judiciary. I think that, uh, when, especially when it is undertaken in a collaborative manner, not just in a sectoral uh, approach, that uh, tends to actually uh, uh, bring out a whole society approach to countering uh, transnational organized crime, whether we are dealing with human trafficking, we're dealing with smuggling, uh, we're dealing with uh, crimes of um, uh, uh, flora and fauna, uh, or we are dealing with uh, even gender-based violence, a whole society approach is uh, in fact uh, uh, very effective because it addresses the multiple drivers of crime uh, at various levels. And then also uh, one of the strategies uh, that um, can work 
is uh, to be seen to be delivering the justice. Uh, in most cases, reporting levels tend to be low when uh, security actors and law enforcement uh, officials, and as well as the judiciary, uh, do not uh, are not perceived as deliver, de delivering the much needed justice. So we have seen the um, emergence of. Uh, vigilante uh, criminal justice systems that are uh, uh, being witnessed where we, we, we see even things like lynching uh, happening uh, in countries like Mozambique is because the communities feel like they don't have any recourse. So uh, what is needed is uh, for civil society organizations to work collaboratively with security actors, with citizens, so that uh, these actors are seen to be delivering the much needed justice uh, for the community. And also um, from, the, uh, from the, the work that I've done with IDRC and also with ACCORD and with other partners such as the Center for the Study of Violence and Reconciliation in South Africa, we've seen that a crime prevention approach uh, is much more important than a reactive approach. So adopting a crime prevention approach, uh, uh, not waiting for incid a, a, an incident focused type of approach, but trying to understand the drivers uh, of the crime, uh, trying to understand what drives young people uh, into drug, uh, drug and alcohol abuse, what drives gender-based violence, what drives uh, uh, trafficking of drugs. I think that is very important. We've seen that happening uh, 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 with the collaboration between uh, the Center for the Study of Violence and Reconciliation, the University of the Western Cape, and the Ministry of Social Development, the Department of Correction, Directions, the Department of uh, Public Services, they want to go to the root of the problem. Some of the uh, drivers uh, include economic causes. Some of the drivers also include issues to do with uh, the psychological dimension of crime. So the issue of parenting, the issue of parental neglect, they work with schools, they work with uh, uh, parental associations and community associations to try and tackle the issues at the center of the community that are driving young people people towards crime. Then the other approach that we have also seen is the issue of uh, the peace building approach to uh, uh, tackling transnational uh, organized crime. Uh, it might seem like it's far-fetched to connect peace and security to transnational organized crime uh, issues, but it's not even far-fetched because uh, Addressing issues uh, related to the insecurity in the communities is bound to promote social cohesion uh, within the communities. It is also bound to ensure that uh, um, uh, where businesses sometimes uh, 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 close shop because of the uh, uh, untenability of uh, um, um, operating because of uh, the rampantness of crime, uh, businesses can be restored. So peace building can actually be used as a strategy and an objective uh, of rebuilding the uh, social fabric of society, but also addressing issues of uh, crime. And then the other um, approach that I've seen that has been used by other partners uh, include uh, what is called the Stay Stop uh, 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 program, which was implemented in South Africa uh, in collaboration with various uh, community-based organizations, including uh, uh, the Center for the Study of Violence and Reconciliation, uh, the Institute of uh, Security Studies, among others. We've seen that uh, when civil society organization partners with security actors, it tends to build trust. It forges a collective ownership agenda towards uh, crime prevention. It also makes uh, citizens feel like they are involved uh, in uh, uh, countering crime. Um, that also relates to the issue of oversight bodies, the importance of oversight bodies, the importance of citizen oversight, uh, creating mechanisms such as Crime Watch, for example, uh, creating mechanisms that also uh, try to oversee the um, uh, performance of uh, law enforcement with respect to human rights, with respect to gender equality, with respect to inclusion, with respect to accountability, with respect to accountability and using the taxpayers' money. All those uh, strategies are very, very important in implementing a broad-based inclusive uh, crime prevention uh, strategy. And then I think last but not least, uh, it is also important 
to uh, we uh, from my experience and also from uh, my observation uh, of uh, some of the civil society work that has uh, taken place uh, in Eastern Africa and also in uh, Southern Africa, the need to shift from um, the, the narrative that the police are a police force, they are a police service, uh, the need to ensure that the police are there to serve the community, the importance of people-centered uh, solutions has been emphasized again and again by many stakeholders. Uh, when the police and law enforcement officials and security actors endeavor to serve uh, the community, they are actually uh, are breaking down the silos and the barriers between themselves uh, and uh, the community members. Uh, again, let, let me touch back on uh, an example in South Africa. South Africa, um, at, in the 1990s, they came up with what is called the Extended Public Works Program, which was designed to address issues of uh, rampant violence, uh, particularly in poor neighborhoods. Um, they uh, established the Extended Public Works Program uh, through the Department of uh, Traditional Affairs and Cooperative Governance, COCTA, uh, and also through the Department of the uh, Social Development and the Department of Public Works. That program in itself saw a, 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 a decline in crime levels, particularly because communities uh, where there were no, no lights in the, in the communities, the communities were responsible for in, uh, revitalizing their, uh, their communities, cleaning up the streets, um, uh, identifying unsafe uh, uh, spaces, but also getting a, some si sort of stipend as they were revamping and uh, improving their, their communities. So we have seen uh, that that extended uh, public works program, now it's called the Communities Works Program. It, is, it, it was piloted in Johannesburg. It's now actually uh, 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 being scaled up to uh, uh, the Western Cape province because of the successes that it has recorded uh, in, uh, in these uh, 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 areas of Johannesburg, which were previously uh, very uh, uh, unsafe. Um, I think uh, it would be remiss of me if I don't touch the issue of gender mainstreaming uh, in crime prevention, uh, in, tra in, in tackling uh, transnational organized crime. It is very important to ensure that, uh, to recognize, first of all, to recognize that uh, the experiences of transnational uh, organized crimes are very gendered. Uh, and by gender, we are not just talking about men and women, but we're also okay. talking about gender from an intersectional approach, the different uh, groups in society, the rural versus the urban, uh, the uh, able-bodied versus the persons living with disabilities. How are those people affected by transnational organized crime? Let me just conclude uh, uh, on the gender issue uh, to say that gender should not essentialize uh, women. Uh, there are also uh, situations even where women have played an active role uh, in crimes, in organizing crimes, in hiding crimes. The issue of drug news, uh, queen pins, uh, is very, very, very rampant in Southern Africa. Uh, the connection between uh, um, uh, drug, uh, women and drug trafficking. Uh, of course, women are, are victims of uh, drug, uh, drug and sexual trafficking, but they also take an active role uh, in uh, tra trafficking those drugs. So understanding the nuanced gender dimensions of those crimes is very important. And this is where civil society role can play through capacity building, through research, through uh, evidence-based policing, and also through being the bridge builder between the citizens uh, and the law enforcement officials. Thank you, Martha. Uh, for um, giving us a compelling uh, argument for a prevention-based as opposed to a reactive incident-based approach to all of this, um, and for talking about civil society as an element of connective tissue, potentially, between citizens and security forces and justice sector actors. That's a really important part of this whole picture, I think. And we'll come back to you um, towards the end for more on um, gender mainstreaming and, and, and thinking about that again. For now, let me turn to Dr. Gernitz and ask you a similar question. What roles can local civil society community leaders and citizens play in relation to um, African state actors in developing strategic responses, either to prevention or to countering 
um, you know, the tramadol trade or uh, the transport of migrants or other things that might be classified sometimes as transnational organized crime. We'll give you um, six or seven minutes to give us your perspective on that. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. And I think actually I just wanted to probably confirm a lot of the points that, that Martha was making, because I really like the idea of, of civil society playing this kind of bridge um, role or, or kind of partner role of bringing um, society or societal actors and, and the criminal justice system together. And I think um, this is especially important because I felt maybe in, in the areas that we dealt with, you know, in, in, in migration or human smuggling and in, in, in the field of drugs and, and sort of the illegal trade of drugs. I mean, I think in, in these areas, the, the civil society actually, actually actors probably have less of a role than they should have. They should actually have more of a role because their role can be very, very productive. Um, and how I want to demonstrate this, um, and actually uh, it's, it's based on our workshop because we had this workshop with all those policy and, 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 and people from civil society as well. And, and the sort of the, the, the conclusion for almost everyone was that, you know, the civil society would have this important role, but it doesn't yet play that role in, in these fields that we look at. And often it's actually international actors who have more of a role than, than local civil society actors, which was a very strange thing. So some of those policy actually more driven by foreign ideas than by locally driven ideas, which they should have. So what I want to show now is just, and I think it, it, it links very much to what Martha said, is, is looking at, at how civil society can provide um, important initiatives in the field of victim support, field of advocacy, um, capacity building maybe as well, and then in terms of research. So just look at these three, areas um, how these locally driven responses by civil society can be quite important. Um, they're not always a partner um, with, with the criminal justice system, sort of in, in the first field of support for victims, for example, you actually feel that um, when we are looking at Agades and, and um, the trade, uh, sort of the transport of migrants, you know, there's, there's organizations like Alarm Phone Sahara, which is an, an, an NGO that, that works in Agades, that provides a kind of helpline for, for migrants that get stranded in the Sahara. Um, and if they get stranded, they would be sent some support. For example, they also try to educate migrants before they go. They tell them what are the risks, what are the benefits, you know, who should you actually um, um, uh, pay something for to, to, to take you across the, uh, across the Sahara, for example. So, but these NGOs or this NGO and many others that do similar work in Agades, they don't actually work very closely with the state and the criminal justice system because they're almost opposed to each other. You know, criminal justice system cracks down, whereas these guys try to, uh, try to support the ones that are um, still trying to cross the, the Sahara anyway. And in, in Nigeria with, with, with Tramadol, we have a similar um, organization that was actually set up with the help of UNODC called LADI, which, which provides legal aid to the many people that kind of get um, in, um, uh, sort of um, end up in, in prison or, or they get detained and then have a, a criminal court um, because they have been using or they have been trading in, in certain substances. Um, and many, many times that, that would be uh, Tramadol as well. So these kind of organizations, they, they, they almost exist in a parallel sphere from, from the criminal justice system. So I think there would be much more need for them actually to work together with the criminal justice system. But at the moment, they, there's very little space for that, um, for those two actors to come together. In the field of advocacy, there, there's more of that. Um, so in, in Nigeria, for example, you know, they had, um, you have organizations like the Clean Foundation, which um, since the late 1990s and early 2000s has actually worked very intensively with the police um, and with the NDLEA, which is the major drug agency there, to actually um, reform its approach to, to drug control and, and, um, and, and policy, so through, I don't know if Martha has mentioned that um, um, uh, sort of shifting the focus of the police from being a police force to a police service, actually servicing the local community, um, community policing sort of falls into that as well. Um, and in the field of drug control, it's similar. You know, this is a field in Nigeria that was established under military rule, actually. So there, there's a, an understanding even within the drug control bodies that they need to demilitarize to some degree. And, and these kind of foundations help with that kind of approach. And I think they are quite successful, but there could obviously be even more of that. 
And then the final thing I think that I also wanted to manage uh, men mention is actually research. Um, civil society organizations have a big role to play in that. And, and we found that in our workshop as well. You know, everyone was saying there should be more research, there should be more local nuance to understanding these problems, for example. And, and um, there is probably far too little. And that's the fault of us academics, actually, and, and researchers. We should maybe not only do our research, but also reach out and, and share it with, with people. And maybe this event today is one way how we do that as well, to some degree. So that's really great. Um, so there needs to be still much more research to understand what these problems are and what they are in different localities, because Agades is different from Lagos, and then the tramadol trade, which also exists in Agades, would work different from the one in, in Lagos as well. So we need to sort of find out how these things work locally and then sort of devise policies. So I think that that's another very important um, role for civil society to further push in, in the field of research. So in general, I think what I wanted to highlight to confirm what, what Martha said about partnerships, that's the key role for civil society, I think, and that can be really extended and also to help give this kind of local and, and research-based elements to responses to, to organized crime. Thank you so much. Thank you for breaking that down really clearly into those three categories and then um, providing some useful examples for us to have as food for thought as we keep going through um, the session. Dr. Gernot, let me stay with you and ask you one final question. Um, what are preventative or rights-based approaches in this field and why are they useful for building community resilience to uh, transnational organized crime? So in other words, could you say a few more words about why a militarized or a criminalized approach alone is insufficient for, for, for dealing with these issues? Um, yes, thanks. So I'll just continue. I think what, what I've started in the previous answer, I think you, you will have realized from my answers that, um, I mean, our whole project is quite critical of criminalization, but it doesn't mean that criminalization is all bad. I mean, it's just something that needs to be supported in a way with a much more preventative approach. Um, and by itself, actually, and that's what we have at the moment in, 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 um, in Nigeria and Niger, to some degree in these two areas that we look at, it actually makes things worse because, you know, it, 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 it in a way just suppresses the problem that we have. You know, Agades, it's now not probably the, the major transit point for, for migrants anymore, but there's other cities um, nearby that have taken on that role. So it, in a way, criminalization doesn't solve the problem, it dislocates it, it, it shifts it somewhere else. Um, it's like a balloon effect, you press it here and it appears over there. Um, and um, and, and with, with drugs is similar, you know, you suppress tramadol and then you would probably have some other substances that will take its role. Uh, it, its role. So it, it can't at, uh, attack or uh, address those kind of underlying factors. They could be poor unemployment opportunities, you know, that people have a, a, a willingness to much more to migrate and find better pastures overseas. You know, you can't address that with criminalization or with, with, with cracking down on, 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 on organized crime. You know, people will find other ways and often they find actually more risky ways. You know, they will find even riskier ways through the Sahara, for example. Um, in, in, in terms of tramadol, you know, tramadol by itself might seem like a easy to solve problem, just abolish it from the market, but actually it's part of a, of a whole healthcare system in Nigeria, for example, that has been underfunded for at least three decades. And so if you don't have hospitals and don't have um, pharmacies that provide those um, affordable medicines to people and advice as well, then people will resort to self-medication and they will resort to the use of tramadol, not always for medical reasons, sometimes also for work-related reasons, because tramadol is, you know, people use it sometimes because they, they want to work harder and then they have very hard lives. Um, so some of the people that use this are, are the ones that have the, the most challenging jobs, if you think about in the building sector, sex workers and, and, and the migrants sometimes as well, obviously. Um, so you would have to address these wider um, um, problems, I think, that, that are much harder to solve, probably more expensive. Um, and, and where the criminal justice system would have to work together with the healthcare system to see how can we manage this? How can we still provide a cheap... Um, um, painkiller, but not push it underground so that people will go for the even more illegal ones. Um, and I think the key thing is always to be 
conscious of the needs of the ones you actually want to protect. You know, you don't want to stigmatize those people even more. The migrants crossing the Sahara, they will do that anyway. But you need to make sure that you actually protect them, that they wouldn't fall uh, prey to some human traffickers, for example, which will exploit them and, 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 and other things as well. So think about those kind of the victims in a sense and really put them at the center of policies. And I think that that's part of a preventative approach as well. And the last thing I think that I wanted to manage, uh, mention, which was also part of our workshop, was this idea of education as a preventative measure. You know, education is often perceived as a very top-down process. You sort of tell potential migrants or young people, drugs are all bad, migration is all dangerous, don't do it. Um, but then people will say, you know, but I have no choice, I will still have to do it. So I think approaches, um, like there was one campaign by the UNODC or funded by the UNODC that, that worked relatively well on Tramadol where they didn't actually tell people don't take Tramadol, um, but just say, you know, this is the, the risks of taking Tramadol, they are serious. Um, and these are the benefits of, of taking Tramadol. In this way, you can make it a bit safer. And in that way, you sort of don't prohibit things, but you actually try to almost engage in a conversation with people about why they want to take it and why they want to travel abroad and what could you expect? You know, what are the risks um, when, when you travel? I think this kind of um, engagement or, or conversation that you need to have with, with people involved in the different places. Again, I say in Agadez, it's gonna be different from Lagos and from all the other cities and, 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 and rural areas um, in, in Nigeria and Niger, but you need to encourage that conversation rather than stigmatizing and discouraging it completely because it wouldn't stop. That's what research has shown. Right. Um, so I think that that should be the, the final point that I would make. Don't, I think uh, prevention is better because it doesn't stigmatize and it allows for this kind of conversation of the actors involved. Absolutely. Yes, thank you for making that point. Um, we are about to turn to Q&A, but before I do that, I would be remiss not to call on Dr. Martha one more time. She started talking about this for a couple of minutes in her last um, response. Um, gender mainstreaming, um, women and other marginalized groups experiencing drivers of, of organizing consequences of organized crime differently. Um, Martha, I just want to make sure if there was anything else you wanted to add to that in uh, maybe, uh, you know, three or four minutes here. Um, you know, what are there any other gender implications to keep in mind for prevention um, in relation to, you know, community outreach, local consultations, victim and witness support? Do you have any final thought on that? Um, we'll, we'll finish up the moderated conversation and then turn to questions for that. Thank you, Kat. Um, I'll just uh, reiterate the importance of um, uh, supporting gender mainstreaming efforts uh, in the security sector. Uh, we, uh, what I've seen in Eastern and Southern Africa is really uh, sustained efforts at uh, supporting gender mainstreaming at various levels. Uh, first, uh, the recruitment uh, level to ensure that there is representation of women in the security sector, in law enforcement, and also in the judiciary. So we've seen uh, uh, collaborations between civil society uh, and international partners like UN Women trying to advance the gender agenda uh, in the security sector. But beyond recruitment, beyond the numbers, we also need to ensure that we tackle the qualitative issues uh, that uh, law enforcement uh, security sector actors face uh, when confronting uh, crime, the gendered nature of the crime, the, the crimes. So it also uh, speaks to the importance of a curriculum review process. Uh, for example, it, in institutions where police are trained. Um, uh, when I was working with UN women uh, in Zimbabwe, we we had an initiative where we actually reviewed all the training curriculum of the uh, Zimbabwe uh, Police Training Center and the National Defense College, because I, I, I think it starts from the mindset. If uh, uh, law enforcement officials are exposed to what are some of the nuances to look out for uh, when doing investigations? What are some of the gendered issues that they need to pay attention to uh, when they're protecting witnesses, uh, when they're listening to evidence? That needs to be embedded in the curriculum. That needs to inform even their code of conduct. So we found that project to be very successful in terms of um, 
uh, uh, producing the next generation uh, of uh, security actors and law uh, enforce enforcement uh, officials who were aware of the gender dynamics when it comes to crime, uh, but also its linkages with uh, human rights violations, uh, how to uh, in, in, uh, set up, uh, for example, things like uh, gender desks, uh, where people can actually report crimes of a specifically gendered nature, which ca cannot be reported in a public uh, 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 reception area where uh, everyone is reporting maybe uh, petty theft um, uh, and other crimes. Sometimes you need to uh, establish a safer space for crimes that uh, people do not feel that they can actually start talking about in front of uh, everybody. So there have been really some moves uh, in East and in Southern African countries to create gender desks and also to create gender focal persons who identify specific needs uh, in the police department, uh, in the security sector actors, in the various uh, line ministries that can be addressed in order to um, uh, ensure that uh, we take uh, an intersectional uh, approach uh, to gender uh, issues. But also beyond uh, looking at the specific needs of women, I think it's also important to look at also the needs of men, particularly young men. Uh, I think in some contexts, ge gender can actually be nuanced to mean the experiences of men and women vis-a-vis -vis, uh, certain issues. Why is it that in um, uh, some societies, uh, it is young men who are more prone to be recruited uh, into uh, political violence, uh, into um, uh, uh, some forms of uh, organized crimes uh, uh, that are of an economic nature, uh, for example. It also speaks to the uh, importance of understanding some of the experiences is that they are going through, like unemployment, uh, like the growing youth population vis-a-vis uh, -vis the lack of uh, service delivery that is affecting many African countries. So gender should be really cross-cutting. It should not just be limited to women, but also uh, seeking to understand particular needs of men, women, uh, old and young, uh, able-bodied, and also pe persons living uh, with disabilities, people living in informal settlements, people living in rural areas, looking at all sectors of society in understanding their unique needs, experiences, but also co-curating solutions with them so that the ownership of crime prevention is a collective agenda. Uh, it's not imposed as a top-down uh, strategy. This is a great way of um, presenting what gender analysis and gender sensitive sort of programming should include. Um, it's not just about women. It's about, as you said, um, different populations, different intersections of society and how they experience things and think about solutions to these things. So thank you for summarizing that for us, Dr. Martha. I will now turn to, um, we will open things for questions now. So we're turning to the question and answer period of the webinar. Thank you to our panelists for their truly excellent insights I, that I am sure are provoking quite a few different questions that will field. Um, and we will start by inviting one particular Africa Center alumnus to pose the first question. Je voudrais demander à mon équipe d'activer la vidéo. I would like my team to activate the microphone and video of Dr. Charles Mouni. And we invited Dr. Mouni to ask the first question on camera as a symbol of our appreciation for the presence of alumni of the Africa Center who are here with us today. We cannot see them, unfortunately, but we would like to at least have one on camera. Charles Mouni is a professor at the Department of Information and Communication of the University of in Canada and co-president of the Insti Pan-African Institute of Economic and Financial Governance. He was the professor of international law in Dakar. He's an attorney and he has been uh, noted for various distinctions. He's worked at the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs in Benin. And he also was the recipient of the Human Hubert Humphrey Fellowship and African Leaders Program here in the United States. So welcome, the floor is yours 
to ask the first question of the session. Dr. Muni, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Katrine. Uh, thank you to give me the honor of asking the first question and allow me to first uh, comment briefly before my question. I would like to congratulate the two presenters to have enlightened us on understanding and determining the resilience to transnational organized crime. We understand better through their uh, ex through their talks that the security in Africa is a very complex issue. It cannot be only uh, responded to uh, by the security forces and police forces, but it has to be one. We need to include all of the stakeholders, as was well said. The role of a community of citizens, of civil society are crucial. And the approach that you have proposed is an approach, it's a holistic approach, participatory approach that you have highlighted. But for the uh, stakeholders, for so that they can play their role well and so that they can take ownership of this, uh, this becomes a daily uh, task and challenge. These they need to uh, they need to become more literate in affairs of security. They need to have a minimum of information, a minimum of training and competency and skills in security issues so that they can uh, uh, so they, they can better understand and fight uh, TCO to, in using strategies and means that are more and more sophisticated. The webinar that we listened to yesterday on these uh, cybernetic dimensions in Africa uh, made this very clear. So my question is the following, knowing that the stakeholders that, of which you have just spoken are very different and the context uh, in which they are acting are also very different, what uh, can the communities and the citizens and civil society, what do they need to know? What do they need to know how to do in terms of security matters to be able to play their roles effectively? And what could be some of the main challenges of a literacy program, a security literacy program in Africa today? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Mimone, for your comment and an excellent first question. I will add um, a couple of other questions to the queue and then turn to Dr. Martha and Dr. Gernet um, to answer multiple questions at once. Um, so in addition to this question, what do different civil society groups need to know in terms of security literacy uh, to deal with um, some of these challenges? Excellent first question. Um, we also have a couple of others. Uh, one is what can you recommend to build bridges to the police and military that tend to be isolated or stove, stove piped. Um, so that's question number two. And uh, question number three um, is about the formal and informal sectors of the economy. Um, since transnational crimes exist in the informal sector, how can the uh, legitimate informal sector uh, or uh, legitimate business sector be strengthened as an alternative. Um, so how are we thinking about legitimate versus illegitimate businesses or um, alternatively and somewhat differently formal versus informal sector businesses and how we think about those different entities. So that's the third question. I will add a fourth into the mix. Um, I think that uh, there's a desire to hear um, a little bit more in most Southern African states, CSOs, civil society organizations, are often seen as opposition to governments. With this misunderstanding, do you see them creating a better environment from which they can help governments deal with these transnational crimes? So this is touching again on sort of different roles that civil society can play or maybe perceived to be playing in different societies. So I will urge both Martha and Garnett uh, to respond um, to all of these questions, um, but in particular, maybe starting with Dr. Mumunis, 
Um, I would let me turn to Garnett first and ask you. There are lots of questions, um, so to keep your responses to each one relatively brief, but um, you can field um, whichever ones you would like. Yeah, thanks a lot. I mean, these are really great questions. Um, and I, I probably wouldn't do justice in answering them properly, so please forgive me for this. Um, but um, if anyone actually has an interest in, in learning more about our research, I will paste the, the link to our research project if that's okay afterwards. But let me just try my best now. Thank you very much, Professor Momuni, for the, the question on, on what to do. And I think it's, it's a very tough one. Um, and um, in terms of the literacy on, on security, I think the two points that maybe I, I where I've sort of touched on, on, on this issue, but probably not, not extensively is, is um, that, that some stakeholders in civil society actually have quite a lot of um, knowledge already about what could be done and what could be done differently. And I think it would be about bringing those, those actors in. I'm thinking in Nigeria, for example, there's a, there's a it's not only a Nigerian NGO, it's, it's called CRISA that works on, on, the, on research on drugs and, and, and alcohol across Africa, actually that works with many partners across the continent that has been trying very, very hard, that, that sort of does a lot of research on, on local drug markets, which ran the first drug household survey, for example, in Nigeria, that has been very, trying very hard to actually engage with the, with, the, with the criminal justice system, but hasn't actually had the chance yet. So I think that, that just needs to be a bit more willingness to engage with those actors that already know quite a lot. With society more in general, I would go back to my point about, you know, this making... Uh, making it not so much an, an educational process, uh, because then it ends up as kind of very top down, but more a kind of engagement process. Um, I'm not a, a West African policymaker to tell you exactly how this would work, and I think it's going to be very tough, but I think the, the, the issues that don't work in West Africa and in, in many other countries is this kind of top down information, you know, TV uh, information campaigns about how dangerous drugs are and things like that. They raise awareness, but they often don't reach the people that they should reach. So I think a more engagement type of approach would probably help. Um, shall I go to the other questions as well, Catherine? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to answer them all, but if you want to pick one. Yeah, I think I, I'll actually take two of them together. Um, okay. So that there was this um, a question about building bridges. Um, um, and, and then the other one about you know, civil society often being seen as in opposition to the criminal justice system. I think that, that's what I tried to bring across as well. I think there should be much more of many more of those bridges, but building those bridges, I think takes time, at least in the country I know best in Nigeria, it really takes a lot of time and it takes time because you need to build trust. Um, because you know, in, in many cases, criminal justice actors um, maybe that's because, you know, we, we 20 years ago, Nigeria was or a bit more than 20 years, a, a military regime where there was this confrontation between civil society actors like NGOs and, and, and state actors. So I think people still need to get used that actually they uh, uh, sort of building a bridge helps both sides, you know, helps one to have more influence on the criminal justice system and the other side to get actually some inputs from below to, to know what, what is important and how things could be improved. Um, so I think what, what sometimes doesn't work with bridge building, I found in our work, is that these foreign sponsored initiatives, which are often quite short lived, and then when they are run out of funding, they just disappear. Often local partners are much better partners for criminal justice actors because they stay there, they know the situation also much better. So to draw on those ones like Clean or Creasa, these kind of um, organizations. Um, and building trust takes time, as I said, because, you know, in the past, they might have been perceived as enemies, but now they, they need to grow together. So I, I wouldn't expect changes immediately, but this takes really time to build those bridges. And, and the organization of Clean Foundation is a good example. They have really good links to the police force in Nigeria. They work very closely and, and do good work together. And the tiny answer to the informal um, sector question um, you know, the informal and the criminal is often sadly conflated. And I think that that's a bit of an, an issue. Um, they, they shouldn't be conflated. Um, so tramadol, for example, is often sold informally, which means it's not regulated by the state, you know, through proper channels. But most pharmaceutical drugs in Nigeria actually sold like that because in the in the formal sector through pharmacies, hospitals, you probably can't get most of the, uh, of the drugs. So, so you cannot 
equate them, they cannot conflate them. So that's the dangerous thing, but they are obviously linked because I think if you wanted to improve access to medicines, you would probably have to strengthen the formal sector to some degree, pharmacies, but also patent dealers. Some of them are now currently criminalized, actually. You would have to bring them into your um, truck supply system, the legal one, and in that way, um, improve the quality of those substances, for example. So they're not the same, but there's links between those two, I think I would say. Absolutely. Yes, that's a very important point about not conflating these things, but then thinking about how they may be linked in, a, in, in terms of policy response. Thanks. Dr. Martha, let me turn to you. Um, so we have those four questions, security literacy, um, dealing with stovepipes in the police and military um, traditionally, um, informal versus formal commerce and how we should be thinking about that. And CSOs being seen sometimes as opposition to governments. How does that affect all of this? Let me add one more thing into the mix um, because I'm not sure we will have time for an extra round. So a fifth question that you could choose to address. Um, somebody had asked if um, we could speak a bit more in depth about victim and witness support. And I know that both panelists have brought that up. Um, uh, and provided some examples of how civil society is involved in that, but is there overarching guidance that you have about how people should be thinking about approaching that aspect? Okay, thank you. Um, so I think I'll start with the one on uh, security literacy. Um, I, I completely agree with uh, Genon about the importance of uh, trying to steer away from um, a top-down approach in promoting security literacy. It needs to be an engagement approach. What I've found uh, is strategies that work uh, is um, legal empowerment strategies, particularly the use of uh, community paralegals uh, is strategies that uh, help to raise awareness, uh, but also to solicit uh, key information from the communities in terms of what are the issues that uh, they are confronting when it comes to access to justice, when it comes to uh, criminality, when it comes to uh, their perception in terms of uh, the way the, the crimes are addressed. So legal empowerment in the, uh, approaches are participatory. They give people a voice and also they uh, uh, create that opportunity for that mutual interaction between citizens uh, and law enforcement as well as uh, uh, security actors in the ju judiciary. So that's uh, is the, the, the education is reciprocal. It's not just law enforcement going there to educate the communities, but it's also the law enforcement being educated by the communities in terms of the nuances of the crime, in terms of the hideouts, in terms of uh, some, uh, some of the strategies that are being employed at the community level to hide the existence of the crime. Um, the second uh, question on the conflation uh, between um, the informal sector in criminality. I think that is one of the biggest problems that we are finding. Um, I am uh, from uh, uh, Southern Africa and uh, it, 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 it sometimes breaks my heart to see people who are trying to eke out a living uh, as uh, vegetable vendors being treated like common criminals, being beaten to the pulp uh, uh, by police in the name of cleaning up the streets. Whereas a more useful approach would be set up designated centers where people can actually pay, uh, whether it's a, a, a race to the city council to be able to use those centers to sell their wares rather than to treat them as uh, uh, common criminals. So uh, engage with the community leaders, uh, identify which areas can be actually designated as areas where they can actually be able to sell in a healthy manner in a legal manner without necessarily treating them uh, like criminals. But on a, a positive note, I'm also seeing association of vendors coming out, um, uh, association of uh, local uh, initiatives. I'm also seeing the integration of uh, research institutes. Uh, for example, in Kenya, we have the National Crime and uh, uh, research, research Center. It's a quasi-governmental organization, but it has uh, helped to spotlight the, uh, the importance of steering away um, 
from criminalizing everything that is regarded as informal because the informal sector is the bulk of the employer for many of, uh, uh, of, of, of people in Southern Africa, in Eastern Africa, and I'm sure even in, in West Africa. So they need to be treated as uh, employers. They are generating employment. They are producing goods. They are servicing a market. So they need to be involved uh, through tripartite consultations between them, the government, law enforcement officials, as well as uh, business actors. Um, the last one, uh, the, the, the third one that I would like to address is the importance of uh, vic uh, victim and witness support. And I would add to that mix the importance of support even to the formerly incarcerated. I think societies by and large tend to uh, treat people who are formerly incarcerated as outcasts in society. And yet they need our support to avoid recidivism, to avoid going back to the life of crime. They need uh, access to skills. They need to access to opportunities. They need to access to reskilling, re retraining, and also to be accepted by their community members. Because sometimes that lack of acceptance forces them. Sometimes you hear cases, anecdotes of people saying, actually, I intentionally committed a crime because it was easier for me to get food Listen, uh, rather than when I was outside. So I think as society, we need to rethink uh, the approach uh, that we deal with uh, people who are formerly uh, imprisoned. And I'm glad that there are uh, institutions such as uh, the Zimbabwe Association for Crime Prevention and Rehabilitation of the Offender, ZACRO, which are working with uh, uh, formerly imprisoned people to give them skills, to give them education. Uh, and it, should, it, it shouldn't start when they are released it should actually start when they are in prison so that you prepare them for a life after imprisonment and you prepare them to reintegrate into the communities. The last one of uh, civil society being perceived as anti-regime or anti-administration. That's also a very, very uh, disturbing and pro problematic uh, element. One way to address that uh, is to create platforms for collaboration, mechanisms for cooperation, mechanisms for sharing information between civil society and the government so that uh, activities that are undertaken by civil society, they are seen to also benefit the government. And what I've also seen working very well is the idea of co-developing and co-curating solutions. For example, with uh, the Institute of Security Studies, they've started now working closely with uh, the police, developing uh, the evidence-based police guide uh, to policing for example, working in collaboration with community members and community leaders. That has actually helped in bridging the, the, uh, the, the trust gap between the police and civil society and between the police and government. Thank you. Many thanks to both Dr. Martha and Dr. Garnett. Um, we are um, just on time to be out of time uh, for this webinar. I want to once again thank you both uh, profusely for sharing so many insights. You packed a lot into this hour and 15 minutes. Thank you so much um, for being with us. Thank you to all of our Africa Center alumni who um, uh, joined us and expressed interest in being here today. Thank you to Dr. Mumuni for appearing on video. And I will just have a few closing announcements. One, for anyone who is interested, the Africa Center will now host an hour long open discussion with video, with microphone for everybody about today's webinar topic after a five minute pause. This will follow non attribution rules and any and all alumni or speakers are welcome to stay on and participate via video if they wish. If you wish to stay, just stay on the line and we will take a five minute break and convert your uh, capabilities so that you can turn on your video. And then finally, I will just say, please consider joining us for the final culminating session of this webinar series on July 29th, when we will summarize the series and examine how the security development and governance nexus can be harnessed to address various aspects of transnational organized crime in Africa, from criminality and vulnerability to resilience. I hope to see you all there later this summer and have a wonderful evening.